Welcome to Microbiology of Infectious Diseases. I am Dr. Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University. We are in the middle of a series on viruses, and we've spent the first few videos really trying to build a mental model for how viruses are structured. And I hope in your studying you'll take the time to look at how a bacterium is structured, a gram-positive and a gram-negative bacterium is structured, and compare that to viruses. And then even the eukaryotic pathogens like the fungi and the protozoa, and how do those compare to viruses? Very, very different little beasts structurally. What we want to do now is look at the life cycles of bacteriophage and why bacteriophage. Well, partly because phage change bacteria. Uh, if you remember from transduction uh, as one of our horizontal gene transfer mechanisms, phage can actually change bacteria genetically. But more importantly, we know way more about viruses from studying phage than we do from directly studying human viruses. It's really, really tricky to study, for example, HIV. Right? because HIV requires uh, a human or a primate alive, and it requires their immune cells to be able to invade and infect. There's some serious ethical issues with you know, injecting HIV into an ape, much less into a, a, a person. Right? So um, we're really limited in a lot of the ways we can study viruses because of uh, the fact that you can't grow them independently. You've got to have host cells. And if the only possible host cells that we know of are human, where are you going to get those, right? That, that gets tricky. And we'll talk about actually some ways for cultivating viruses in the laboratory. But bacteriophage are a piece of cake. Bacteriophage like to infect bacteria. So here's hapless little E. coli. And we can infect them with a, a T-even phage. One of the phages we know likes to infect E. coli. And we can learn all about the life cycle of viruses by doing that. Uh, and we can do it completely guilt-free, right? At least I hope so. Okay, so let's talk about the two main cycles, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. And then we're gonna look at some important results of this lysogenic cycle in particular. All right, hopefully you've done a little reading. What I want you to do is pause the video here and I want you to take these five terms. These are stages of the lytic life cycle of bacteriophage. And I want you to sort them in order. If you've not done the reading, pause and go back and do all the reading you're supposed to do before watching the videos. It will make a big difference for you. And then work your way through, number these, one through five. What has to happen first, and then what, then what, then what, and then how does it all end? Okay, pause. All right, if you're hearing my voice, I assume that means you paused and you went through this whole process. So what I want you to do now is think about those five steps, assembly, attachment, release, penetration, and synthesis. Here's the lytic cycle of bacteriophage. Here's our little virus particle, also called a virion, with its DNA. Remember, the vast majority of bacteriophages have double-stranded DNA. We have to start with attachment. Now, some textbooks, some um, standardized tests might call this adsorption. All you need to know about adsorption is adsorption means sticking to a surface. So attachment hopefully makes sense that it's also adsorption, sticking to a surface. What mediates that? What carries that out? Remember, it's the tail fibers that are mediating this. Now, I'll tell you, it can't be spikes. Why can't it be spikes? Are phages ever enveloped? Why can't phages, and, and there's always rule breakers out there, but 99% of the time, why can't phages be enveloped? Because to be enveloped, the cell, the pardon me, the virion has to push its way through a, a, a plasma membrane and take some of it off with it like a little bubble. What gets in the way of that happening with bacteriophage? The peptidoglycan layer, the, the cell wall is in the way. And so the phage can't gently push their way through the membrane and get wrapped up in some of that. So we're talking about naked viruses that have exposed tail fibers. The tail fibers determine the host specificity. That host specificity, in other words, the specific host that they can attach to is determined at this first stage of attachment. Okay, with, with a bacteriophage, the next stage is gonna be injection or penetration. This is when the viral DNA is going to enter into the cell. Now, one thing I don't like about this diagram is there's no reason for this protein coat, this capsid, to be separated from the surface of the cell, right? The tail fibers are still there. The chemical interactions that brought it there in the first place are still holding it there. It's not gonna somehow let go uh, after it's injected its DNA, but 
we'll, we'll forgive the diagram because otherwise it's really good. Only the DNA crosses the cell wall in this entry phase. The, the capsid itself does not. The next step is biosynthesis. We need to make a lot of copies of that DNA and a lot of copies of the capsomeres and the tail fibers, etc. And it turns out that most of the time it appears that they build a lot of these materials before ever assembling them. And so all the raw materials are built up, lots of copies of everything. And then when it reaches a critical mass, they all get assembled. So we go from biosynthesis to assembly and packaging. Packaging meaning, okay, assembly meaning that the proteins are assembled into the capsids. Packaging meaning that the DNA is packaged into the capsid heads. Sometimes this is called maturation. The individual virions are maturing inside the host cell. And then finally we have release. Lysozyme is often involved to break through this peptidoglycan here on either side, right? To break through the peptidoglycan so it's a lot easier for the virions to come out. A typical burst size meaning the number of virions that are released when it's finally time to lyse the host cell could be anywhere from 100 to 300 virions as a ballpark uh, estimate. So that's the lytic cycle of phage. What we're going to see in a later video is that human viruses, the majority of them follow this same pattern with a few key differences, and we'll talk about those key differences, but the majority of viruses that infect humans follow this pattern of a lytic cycle, just like we see with the bacteriophage. All right, so there's the lytic cycle. Now there's another cycle that some phage can follow, not all, but a significant percentage of them, can follow something called the lysogenic cycle. Okay, the lysogenic cycle. Lysogeny is a very different process. And so if you've not yet read or studied what's going on in lysogeny, go review that and come back. And then I want you to uh, pause this video. And then I want you to add three new terms, induction, cell division, and integration. Where does induction happen in a lysogenic cycle? Where does cell division happen? Where does integration happen? A couple quick terms. Um, if we talk about a lytic or virulent phage, what we mean is one that only has, only has a lytic life cycle. That's the only option. It has to kill its host. If we talk about a temperate or lysogenic phage, we mean that it has the lytic cycle as an option, and it has this lysogeny that we're looking at right now as an option. It has both as possibilities. All right, pause and add these three terms. Where do these three happen? Hey, you're back. I'm sure you paused because I told you to. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to look at the same idea as that lytic cycle, but we're going to integrate some options because remember these temperate or lysogenic phage have the choice to either lyse the host cell or lysogenize it. So let's start with step number one up here at the top of the page. Attachment. We know that specific adhesion has to happen, and then the DNA is going to get injected. Turns out when phage DNA gets injected, it circularizes. See this middle point here? It circularizes just like a plasmid. Really suspicious how much uh, phage uh, behave like like vir or like plasmids, and plasmids behave like phage. Okay. If it's a lytic only virulent phage, then it automatically has to go to the left and follow the red cycle, where new phage DNA and proteins are synthesized, they're assembled into virions, the cell is lysed, the new phage particles are released, and we start the cycle all over again. However, if it's a temperate or lysogenic phage, there's a decision point here at number two, where the plasmid, plasmid, the phage DNA could actually, instead of being expressed and a whole bunch of virions produced through biosynthesis and maturation, the phage DNA can actually be instead integrated into the bacterial chromosome. And when it's integrated in there, it's somewhat quiet. The genes aren't being expressed and the viruses are not being made and the host cell is not being killed. We call this stretch of DNA the prophage. Now up in step 4b, in the middle right-hand side of the screen, you can see that then as the host cell 
grows and divides and doubles by binary fission. Every time it replicates its DNA, the prophage gets replicated. This is an alternative strategy to making more viruses. Except what's happening is the cell is just simply making more viral DNA without making new virus particles, and the host cell is allowed to live. At some point, something happens called uh, something happens called induction. Induction is when something triggers the phage prophage DNA to excise itself and enter into the lytic cycle. That might be an hour after it lysogenized the host. It might be a hundred years after it lysogenized the host. And in fact, during cell division and DNA replication over here at 4B on the right-hand side, if mutations are accidentally introduced to the prophage DNA, the prophage may lose its ability to induce and ever leave. So when we sequence a chromosome, of, um, of a bacterium, we often find prophages that are what we call cryptic, meaning they've lost their ability to ever leave and make virus particles. And so the only way they're persisting and existing is in a DNA form. So what would cause uh, a phage DNA to quote unquote want to integrate versus when would it want to lyse its host cell? Pause for a minute and think about that. So we're at this, this either-or decision here, okay? When would it choose one route versus the, the other? Click pause, think about it, and then hear my answer. Okay, I am assuming you thought about it. If the host cell is not particularly healthy or actively dividing, it makes more sense to lyse the cell, use up all its resources to make more phage particles, and spread. If, however, the host cell is healthy, and dividing, it's more likely to integrate its, itself as a prophage into the host chromosome and replicate in this non-destructive way because it could go on for so many generations. What causes it then to induce at step number five? Very likely it's some signal that says that the cell is in trouble. It's slowing down in its, its ability to undergo binary fission, um, maybe it's uh, being exposed, for example, to UV light and it's taking on damage. If that host cell dies before the prophage is able to excise itself and start making virus particles, that's the end of the lineage for that uh, phage as well, right? The phage has to get out if it's going to survive. So it's going along for a ride over here under many cell divisions, but it's constantly sensing the conditions. And when things get bad, it's going to excise itself through induction at step five, and then it's going to re-enter the lytic phase. Uh, so think about that. That's complicated. It's crazy. Uh, but I want you to, to really spend some time on this figure right here, working through lytic and lysogenic cycles, and make sure you understand the difference between a lytic or virulent phage that only has a lytic cycle option versus a temperate or lysogenic phage that has both options available to it. So uh, what happens when a host cell when a, a virus uh, lysogenizes its host cell? Well, a few things can happen. We find that the host cell is typically immune to being reinfected by the same or similar virus. It's almost like the virus gets in, it changes some of the surface molecules uh, where that specific attachment happens. It's like the virus is claiming that cell as its property. It's like, hey, I got here first. Find your own cell to hijack or whatever. And then because of the process of transduction, right? because of transduction, there's horizontal gene transfer that can take place as well. Um, so when, hey, let's go back actually and explain it right here at... There's two steps that it could happen at, right? Here at induction, when the prophage is excising itself, it's actually a pretty sloppy process. And even though in the drawing it's showing only the red prophage DNA coming out, it can take some of that purple chromosome with it. In which case, all of our virus particles down here are going to have uh, both a combination of the viral DNA and some chromosomal DNA with it which means if we follow it all the way back around to here again, when it reintegrates into a new host cell, it brought some new DNA with it. Okay, that's how transduction takes place. There's a, a, one other way transduction can take place if we go all the way back to our lytic cycle. 
in our lytic cycle during this assembly and packaging phase here, packaging DNA into the, the capsids is actually a little bit of a sloppy, non-specific process. And when a virus infects a host cell, it often chops up the host cell's chromosome into smaller pieces. And sometimes those smaller pieces accidentally get packaged into the virions instead of the virus DNA. In which case, if one of these virus particles, let's say it's this little guy right here, picked up some, some uh, bacterial DNA instead of its own DNA, now when it bursts and comes out and starts the cycle over again, instead of injecting viral DNA into a new host cell, it injects chromosomal DNA from its last host. Again, another form of transduction. Sometimes this is referred to as phage conversion. Okay, and Phage conversion has led to some really important changes in bacteria over time. I'll give you three examples from the world of toxins. Carinibacterium diphtheriae is a bacterium that causes the disease diphtheria. It's a pretty harmless organism, except for a, a, a fragment of viral DNA that it has that gave it a toxin. Now, we don't know where that toxin came from originally, but it's associated with a virus. And so Carinibacterium diphtheria is a bacterium that's been infected with a virus, and the viral DNA is what causes diphtheria, ultimately. Clostridium botulinum, you're familiar with that, causes botulism. The botulinum toxin is actually associated with a phage, as opposed to being part of the normal chromosome of Clostridium botulinum. Vibrio cholerae causes cholera, um, possibly the, the deadliest pathogen, except for maybe tuberculosis in human history. And the cholera toxin is found on a phage. In fact, Vibrio species are just marine bacteria. They're really common in the ocean. And the species cholerae is really only different from its marine cousins because of this viral cholera toxin that it picked up. Who knows where that cholera toxin originated, but it was picked up through transduction and by, by phage conversion, this lysogenized host has brand new properties. All right, wow, another, another brain full there. Spend some time thinking through this cross-referencing your textbook. Quick summary, point number one, much of what we know about viruses comes from studying phage. And so it's real important that we spend time with phage in order to understand the viruses that infect people. Some phage have to always destroy their host in order to replicate. We call those lytic phage. And most human viruses follow this path. Most human viruses too, with a couple exceptions that we'll look at in another video. Some phage can integrate their DNA into the host bacterium's chromosome by what we call lysogeny. These guys up here are virulent phage. These are temperate phage, right? So, and we saw that with lysogeny, the host cell doesn't necessarily get killed, at least not in the short term. Maybe later it'll get killed. And then we know that lysogeny changes bacterial properties. Think of some of those toxins like botulinum toxin, cholera toxin, diphtheria toxin, all picked up by um, viruses and handed off to their host cells through what we call transduction, right? One of the horizontal gene transfer mechanisms that's so important to us. That was a really busy lecture. There's a lot going on in that. Watch it as many times as you need to and see how it jives with what you've got in your textbook as well.